Well, good morning, Life Group leaders. I got to tell you, I, I always feel guilty that I always seem to get the best passages of Scripture and the best lessons to teach. Uh, and I didn't scheme it. I'm not Jacob. It's just the way it has shaken out. Our lesson today is going to be Lesson 10. And our text is found in Genesis chapter 37. It's a very significant point in Genesis because now enters the story of Joseph. Joseph is one of those unique Old Testament examples of Christ. Uh, theologians call that a type or an illustration of Christ. And as you see some Old Testament characters, we see shadows or pictures of the coming Messiah. The story of Joseph is the longest narrative in Genesis and probably in the entire Bible. Now, i got to tell you, I think the writer of the lesson did a really good job giving us an overview of the text. In fact, his opening illustration is really good. As I read his illustration, and then as I began to study the passage, there's a verse that came to my mind that connects us to the illustration and the text, and that is Romans 8.28. And I'm going to be sharing that verse and the importance of that verse. And I'm going to let my class know that it is the all things that we must accept. You see, the all things in that verse in Romans uh, is what challenges us. It may not be immediate, but leading up to the all things is very important. In fact, it may be even painful. But the verse tells us, if we love God, and if we realize that we have been called according to his purpose, then all that we do will, will work out. Nothing just happens in our lives. There is no good or bad luck, or there is no happenstance. God is sovereignly in control of all things, and as he controls all things, that means that he controls our lives. Now, that does not mean that we are robots, and it does not mean that we won't make bad decisions from time to time. But let me tell you what I found in my life. Even my bad decisions turn out to be good ultimately. It may take some pain, and it may take some time, but God is a purposeful God. In our lesson, we will see the unseen hand of God in every seen. Now, I'm going to start my lesson not in verse 5, but I'm going to start in verse 1, because when Moses wrote Genesis, chapter 37 gives us a big shift. In fact, if you'll look at verses 1 and 2, you'll notice that the Bible says these are the records of the generations of Jacob. Now, the reason I'm going to start here is because Esau has departed from the land of promise. In effect, Esau acknowledged Jacob's right, moved out of the picture, and that allows us to see Jacob continue to move on and allows us to see Joseph enter. On page 85 of our lesson, our writer gives that good overview. And here's what I think I'm going to do. I'm just going to kind of walk through that. My goal of the lesson uh, with a limited amount of time, 20, 25 minutes, is to pull from the text some takeaway points, something that uh, the overview is going to help me do in the time frame that I have. You know, history often repeats itself. And one of the lessons we learn from the text is that favoritism is in many families, and it's bad. When it happens, there's pain. Jacob's parents played favorites, and Jacob did it as he saw. Be careful, parents. Every child is different and must be treated as an individual, but love can't play favorites. And as we model our lives in front of our kids, they see our values. They see what's important to us, and they see what's important, what's not important to us. 
Now, Jacob made some questionable decisions as a teenager. Ah, but who hasn't? Actually, I think he was trying to obey his father. That can be debated. Jacob had two dreams, and he shared his dreams. You have to be careful of who you share your dreams to. Now, his dreams were about the future and were truthful, even if this teenager did not understand what they meant. Now, Jacob should have, but apparently he must not have. And we'll address that in a moment. Jacob gave him a beautiful coat, which confirmed to the brothers his favorite status. But more than that, that Jason, Jacob, I'm sorry, that Joseph was the heir apparent, even though that he was at the bottom of the chain of the brothers. This increased their hatred of him. Hate is always wrong. Nobody wins in hate. And when hate rules, additional sin always takes place. Now, was Joseph perfect? No, only Christ is. One writer called him a good boy sinner. Now, we know this was part of God's larger plan. But let me remind you of something. In God's plan, God works in time and in place and with people. So people are always involved in the larger plan of God, and so are we. Furthermore, God always works through everyday life situations using his natural laws. Remember, his hidden hand is a sure hand. All events are in his hand. It's at this point in the lesson that I'm just going to throw out some takeaways. There's like five or six of them. First thing is this, not every mistake is a sin. Now, it may be poor judgment. I can write a book on that. It may be youthful ignorance, might even be excitement. But even if it may be mistaken or even blind obedience that goes south, I think it's wrong to write every decision we make and everything we do off to just sin. We live with the effects of the garden, which means none of us are perfect. But not every thing we do, and not every decision we make, is sin. The second thing I'm going to throw out is this. Discernment takes time. And what I mean by that is that Joseph, in his dreams, may not, probably did not, realize what they meant. Even Jacob seems to have missed it. But God was working right then for something that was going to take place 400 years to show itself. God's larger picture is never seen until God is ready for it to be seen. But he is working right now for that moment. He must work now for then. And that's in your life as well. And don't forget that. The things you're going through now, the pain or whatever it is that you're going through now, you may not know the reason until 5, 10, 20, or perhaps even till eternity. But we have to believe that God is at work. That's what Romans 8.28 tells us, that God is at work in our lives, and it'll be shown at the proper time. Let me throw something out that you might use as an adder to the lesson, okay? Jacob, I think, should have known what God was doing through those dreams because God told Abram and I think that was passed down because Moses obviously knew about it because he wrote the book of Genesis and he told Abram that Jacob's people would be taken to a far land and afflicted for 400 years then the nation would be judged God's people would be rescued and come out of that with great wealth and so either Jacob wasn't paying attention or he was a little dull in his discernment. I don't know. But you might want to throw that out because I think that's a point that could be made. The third thing I'm going to throw out is this. Be careful who you tell your dreams to. A dream is a dream. Some of them come true. Many of them do not. You just got to be careful of your dreams. One of the things that I, I've learned as a pastor 
is I have to be careful of who and what I share my dreams with. You know, I got to be careful of my thoughts. If I, um, over the years, have shared some things with someone, like things I'm just thinking about, dreaming about, and and maybe getting some perspectives on, and then <laughs> amazingly, in a few days, I start getting phone calls and people say, "Well, why are we going to do that? Or when are we going to do that?" You know, and so you got to be careful of your dreams. The brothers can be dangerous. I guess sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I don't know. Number four, when it's time for God's revelation to happen, even if there is pain, it will happen, and ultimately it will be beautiful. There were 400 years of affliction, but God rescued his people. God brought them to the land of promise. And so we have to remind ourselves that it is always God's plan and God's time in our lives. And then number five, remember, partiality is wrong, especially in family units. As adults, I know we are more friendly with some than others, but that does not mean partiality. That simply means friendship. And I think we should treat all people with dignity and respect, even though some will be closer to us than others. And then number six, finally, there's always a deeper meaning than what is just before your eyes and what is said when God is up to something. And so we need to practice discernment. And we need to practice listening to the voice that is within us, the voice of the Holy Spirit, as we pray and study God's Word, and as we try to be what God would have us to be. Now, these are the six things that I'm going, that I grabbed from the text, and six things that I'm going to grow, throw out to the class. Now, I know there's more, and you'll have some other things that you'll come up with, but maybe that'll kind of help you as we uh, go through a, a wonderful, wonderful text. Well, I think it'll be a good lesson. I hope you have a great time with it. Let me remind you, uh, what we do, we do for the honor and the glory of God, according to the text as it is written. Our goal is to not just glorify God, but to touch as many lives. And we do that by becoming disciples of the Lord Jesus ourselves and encouraging others to be, to be disciples that's what our church is trying to, be, to become, and I think we're making some progress. God bless you. I so appreciate what you do. Have a good day.